And then, well, for you to understand why bones would fracture easily in old people, say for example, someone who's in their 20s may just fall and be okay, and we have to kind of learn about the composition of bone. All right, so the composition of bone is shown on this pie graph here. <clears throat> so basically how it breaks down um, the extracellular matrix of bone, the chemical composition, it gives bone a mineralized quality, giving bone marked rigidity while retaining elasticity. So there that down. So this will kind of help us understand why bones shouldn't break. They do, but why they shouldn't break. Extracellular matrix of bone is mineralized. That's the key because I think it's the only tissue I know of that does mineralize. This gives bone marked rigidity, giving bone marked rigidity. Retaining its elasticity. I mean, bone is a living tissue. I mean, it's hard, but when they break, they heal, they remodel, okay? When you grow, they lengthen. And so, this living tissue can be understood better if you understand that this mineralized part is an inorganic matrix surrounding a, an organic matrix, preceded by an organic matrix. So when people say organic matrix, they're referring to what the cells can secrete, okay? So the, the organic matrix of bone it's about one third of bone, about 33% by weight. And what it is, it's like a little bit of proteoglycans and ground substance, like any other connective tissue. It's mostly collagen, mostly collagen. Now, collagen is not mineralized. It's just a fiber, right? So some people call this collagen, ground substance stuff, the osteoid, if you ever see that term, osteoid. The osteoid is the organic part of bone. Now, when that organic part becomes mineralized, then we call it the inorganic extracellular matrix. Let's just say it's the rest of the bone, about the other two thirds, about. Okay. So these mineralized crystals have become deposited in the osteoid, making it hard. And um, they're called different names. Sometimes books call them the hydroxyapatite crystals. I'm not sure why, hydroxy. Molecular formula is calcium phosphate. And 
that's the correct molecular formula. Well, anyways, this is the whole mineralized, giving bone, marked rigidity. And they're both important. Okay, I mean, you need some osteoid that becomes mineralized, but you need both. This kind of two thirds, one thirds thing. I mean, if you took away the organic part, bone becomes very brittle. get brittle bone without the organic part. And I, and I guess if you well, take away the, the mineral part, then bone becomes rubbery. But you don't really take away one or the other, I mean, uh, but if, if you did. So you need both. Bones are known for being hard, but there is an organic component there. And um, because of these crystals, bone makes a great calcium reserve for the body. Okay. Blood calcium are one of those things your body hormonally likes to regulate because uh, calcium is very important for muscle function. So since you, have, you deposit a lot of calcium in your bony skeleton, you can kind of tap that as a source if you need it. So it helps to start off um, understanding the matrix of bone by talking about the bone cells. And the first cell listed there is an osteogenic cell. I'll talk about those when I discuss um, ossification of bone. So let's table it for now. Let's just start with the adult bone cells that we'll see. That, that's the osteoblast. Now, if you were to describe it, it's kind of like an epithelial cell. They're basically simple columnar cells. Um, you just call them osteoblasts, but they look like epithelial cells. And basically, that's what they are. These are cells that they basically build bone. And when they do that, they're basically secreting an osteoid. Secrete osteoid. Okay, that's how they're building the bone. And then the osteoid becomes mineralized, right? And then you've got your matrix of bone. Becomes mineralized. Now to do that, you have to take calcium out of the blood because cells can't generate the elements of the periodic table. They can make proteins, but they, they can't make the calcium. So you have to extract that from the blood. So you take your calcium ions from blood and you deposit them into bone. building bone. So osteoblasts build bone. Sometimes the osteoblasts in building the bone, they kind of become surrounded by the inorganic matrix and it's like they become trapped in the bone, so to speak. Trapped between layers of bone. And you call that cell an osteocyte. It'll maintain the matrix. So it has all those like little spickly things coming off of it. Site. 
it's basically the mature bone cell that maintains the matrix. A lot of time, the suffix for a blast for a cell, it, it's a little immature. It may become something else. That's usually what we see in anatomy. Osteocytes, the main cell, maintains the matrix. It's basically an osteoblast that has become trapped between layers of bone that it made. Look at it that way. An osteoblast that has become, I don't know if trapped is the right, right word, trapped between layers of bone. Um. Do you have a question? I it was just a reference. When we were looking at the compact bone um, slide, Yeah. is that what that, is those little black dashes? Mm -hmm. That's what that is, okay. Um, there's, yeah, we'll look at a picture of what she's uh, saying there, Ann. Um, do you remember how the chondrocytes are in what? Yeah, they're in the cartilage and the space around the, uh, the lacuna. lacuna. These have lacuna too. You have osteocytes in lacuna. Because you have to have a space so the matrix isn't like on you, right? It's like suffocating you. So these are also in lacuna. But because it's like, and again, the E pluralizes it. Now, because blood has to diffuse to you. It's like when you're stuck in these layers of bone, you want to like have little extensions into the layers so the blood can reach you easier. That's why those cytoplasmic extensions are there. And it's like it's punching a little canal in the layers of bone so blood can get to it, so it can survive. And those little canals where these extensions lie are called canaliculi in canaliculi. All right, so you got osteoblasts, build the bone, osteocytes, maintain the matrix. The osteoclast is responsible for bone resorption. That's the fancy way of saying bone breakdown. cells and they're multinucleated. You see a lot of nuclei, maybe a dozen. So they're called osteoclasts. These are um, from a different cell line as the osteoblast. Remember, the osteoblasts become osteocytes, so they're, they're kind of along the same lineage of cells. Osteoclasts are more like from the macrophage line. They're, they're not like macrophages. Like. Have you ever seen me draw this M? That's, my, that's the shorthand for macrophage, because that's like the Greek symbol for phage. Um, anyways, these cells, they're bone resorbers. Bone, bone resorption. So that means bone breakdown. If you look at the ruffled edge of the cell, that's the edge that touches the bone. And from that edge, it's going to release like lytic chemicals that'll break down the bone. <laughs> and in doing that, breaking down the bone, you're, you're liberating the calcium from the inorganic matrix. What's that going to do to blood calcium? Make it go up? 
or make it go down. If you're freeing the calcium and it gets into the blood, wouldn't calcium go up? Yeah, that's how I want you to think about it. So, the, you know, basically, if you increase the activity of the osteoclast, blood calcium goes up. What if you have more increased activity of the osteoblast? What is the effect on blood calcium? It should be the opposite, because those cells take calcium out of the blood and deposit it into the bone. So those cells are probably working more after you, you know, eat a lot of leafy green vegetables that have a lot of calcium in it and get the blood calcium up and deposit it. So, okay, that's the osteoclast. Let's move on. So let's talk about how bone forms and development is the process of ossification, tissue becoming bony. This happens in development when we want to develop our skeleton. It happens when we don't want it. You can have ossification of blood vessels. Do you think that's good? That's not good. You don't want ossification inside your blood vessels. They'll get all stiff and crackly. It's not good, prone to uh, have an aneurysm. And I always see, I keep talking about cadavers. Well, if you're taking a class from a person who dissects cadavers because you're in an anatomy class, so I'll tell you all about it. Stiff vessels, they're so stiff. I had one that was a femoral artery. I tried to cut it with a scalpel and I couldn't cut it. it was so calcified. Um, a lot of times I speak to embalmers who um, you know, prepare cadavers for um, a funeral service and they'll tell me all the time when they inject large arteries, they're crackling because of the calcification over time, which is a pathological condition. Uh, we don't like to see it. It's a, it's a high area of research the ossification of arteries. Now for us, we won't talk about the pathology, we'll just talk about <laughs> how it's supposed to happen when you develop your skeleton during field development. It, it occurs at about three months gestation, that's pregnancy, um, and it occurs in two ways. Both involve the replacement of some kind of primitive tissue with bone. So that's ossification. Generally, the process where you replace some other tissue with bone. And it's going to be some connective tissue, whether it be a fibrous tissue or a cartilage. Replace it with bones. We're going to learn about that process. You have intramembranous ossification, where you replace this fibrous CT, connective tissue, that it's called a mesenchyme, intramembranous. So you replace a mesenchyme, which is a fibrous CT, fibrous connective tissue. Just replace that with bone. So you have some pictures of that process. And as the name implies, intramembranous, these, this bone is like occurring, it's just showing up between layers of membrane. Okay, it's like from within. Now, certain, only certain bones do this, and I think I have them listed there, like cranium, clavicles, flat bones. Cranium, clavicles. I know we haven't had skeleton yet, but the cranium, you know what the cranium is, right? Your head, your skull, your, your flat skull bones. Clavicles are your collarbones, right? Um, we also see this in the sternum. I'll just throw it out on there. Um, the, your hips, you can put your hands on your hips. That's the iliac bone of your hip. These, these are all flat bones where you're gonna like have this kind of ossification, okay? So pretty much the rest of the bones are in endochondral ossification.
So there's that word root again. This chondral thing is a word root cartilage, right? Endo means within. So this, it means within cartilage. We'll talk about that. Um, replace cartilage with metal. Now, we, we learned about different kinds of cartilage. This one's going to be a hyaline cartilage. I want to know that. It's hyaline cartilage. And pretty much long bones form this way. Long bones. Like, you know, femur. Uh, humerus. Okay, let's look at the pictures in your book. They're pretty useful. Let's start with intramembranous ossification. This process, what the picture shows you is you're getting osteoblasts that kind of show up. They're derived from the mesenchymal cells, um, and they become osteoblasts clustered together, call it an ossification center. So the first thing that happens. So again, we're about three months pregnant, and this is the development that's happening. step <clears throat> I'll just say it simply mesenchymal cells become osteoblasts <clears throat> now so these mesenchymal cells are stem cells stem cells are good at differentiating into a more mature kind of cell. And the osteoblasts, they, they form an ossification center. That's what you see there. And they, they do what they do. They secrete osteoid. Form what's called ossification center, which is a, just a fancy way of saying you have a cluster of osteoblasts, and they're secreting osteoid. That's basically what's happening here. So, we know what happens. You secrete the osteoid, it becomes calcified, and so now you have a bone matrix. It's secreted within the fibrous matrix, it calcifies, the osteoblasts begin to secrete osteoid, which is calcified within a few days, and the trapped osteoblasts become osteocytes. We mentioned all that before. So I'm writing osteoid calcifies We have the quote unquote trapped osteoblasts are now osteocytes. And notice you're going to continue to have more osteoblasts at the outer edge of your matrix adding on. Okay, it's like you're gonna like expand this. These, these continue to secrete osteoid, and it's all just gonna become calcified, calcified, calcified. That's all that's happening here. And this is all happening within a fibrous tissue, not cartilage. This is a fibrous matrix. That's why it's intramembranous. It's within a membrane. All right, the third step here. We have woven bone that forms and the periosteum that forms. Let me read what's on the slide here. So the accumulating osteoid is laid down between the embryonic blood vessels in a random manner. The result is a network, you know, um, it's not lamellar bone. It's a network of trabeculae called woven bone. The vascularized mesenchyme condenses on the external surface and becomes periosteum. So there's a lot going on here. The blood vessels are very important. You can't choke them off. You can't choke off the blood supply. 
So that's why you form the bone around the blood vessels, and it becomes woven, because blood vessels go all over the place. So that's the first thing here. So. Step three, the main things we're showing you is get woven bone, get periosteum. Periosteum, as we'll see, it's the covering of bone. Okay? It's a very dense, fibrous connective tissue. That's not bone. It covers bone. Okay? So you're getting both of those in this step. So what happens is, for the woven bone, Bone forms around blood vessels. Okay, so that's bone appears woven. That's the woven bone. Think of woven bone as an immature bone. Very fragile. So external to that the mesenchymal, cell, mesenchymal cells are going to condense. So these cells are condensing, and that's going to be the periosteum covering this bone. That's how the periosteum forms. Mesenchymal cells condense. forming periosteum. Periosteum is very important. When you break your bones, you feel it. The periosteum is usually highly innervated with nerves. It, it helps stabilize joint capsules. Um, when muscles use tendons to insert in the bone, it uses the periosteum. It's very important. Okay, well, so we'll just note it for now. This is how it forms. You'll see it a lot later. So in the last step here, we have lamellar bone replaces woven bone. So what you're seeing there is, is a spongy bone sandwich. Okay? So it's like you have your woven bone that has woven around blood vessels. It's like making like a thin tunnel, <laughs> I don't know, around a blood vessel. But the tunnel, you don't want it to collapse. So you put layers of bone around it. So it's like, say you have a blood vessel. Right, you know, cross section of a blood vessel right there with blood in it. And when you made the woven bone, you just put bone around it. You call that woven, right? But that's too delicate. That tunnel might break. So put more layers around it. I'll just use a different color to illustrate the more layers. Put another layer, and another layer, and another layer. So you have many layers now. You don't just have the first one. So you call that lamellar bone. It's more mature and it's better. Um, lamellar means many layers, like layers of an onion. Okay. So that's what we're getting here. Uh, lamellar bone basically now notice in the middle that lamellar bone I say it as a second bullet point the lamellar, the lamellar bone in the middle is a spongy bone it's less dense because it was originally woven bone around all the blood vessels so in the middle is a spongy bone so the lamellar, lamellar bone comes in two forms. One, spongy. Spongy bones in the center. What spongy bone, what do you have? They call them like trabecula. Lamellar bone um, is 
bone. Uh, yeah, that, that means kind of like complex network too, like tiny struts. Um, so if you see trabecular bone, sometimes they use that term instead of spongy bone. Okay, it's this. All right, it's many layers surrounding something, probably a blood vessel. Okay. Now the other on the outside, on either side of the spongy bone, I call it a spongy bone sandwich because in the middle is the spongy bone, but the sandwich or the bread would be compact bone on either side. So the outside layers. And here the lamellar bone is in osteons. So I'm writing lamellar bone is arranged in osteons. I already talked about osteons when I taught that compact bone structure uh, before. Okay. Well, we'll look at pictures of both later. Uh, because I have another ossification process to teach you. Before I move on to this one, are there any questions about these four steps or the intramembranous one? So, for our race number four, what we've got, spongy bone surrounded by compact bone, we got all these like trabecular struts in the middle. We have many layers of compact bone in our little bone sandwich there. So that's trabecular bone, that's compact bone. Flat bone has this structure. Okay, this is so this is what we get at the end as an end result. The flat bone. And most of these flat bones have red marrow. That's important to know. Will contain red marrow. Red marrow is the bone marrow that produces the blood cells. So when you learn about that in the blood, just know that it's, it's in the bones. Okay. So red marrow, that's important. Endochondral ossification is uh, from within the cartilage. We wrote that before. It originates as this kind of hyaline cartilage dumbbell. So here's what we have to start with. This is our, what we have to work with is hyaline cartilage. This is a long bone. The first thing you do is to note what we call the shaft versus the knobby edges. This is of a long bone, right? So kind of like the center part, the shaft of the bone is, is referred to as the diaphysis. And the two knobby ends, whether it be this one or this one at the top, are both epiphyses. Epiphysis here. Epiphysis down here. And so what we got here is a situation where this cartilage is going to go away, mostly. <coughs> and you want to provide stability to the shaft so the thing doesn't collapse. And so that's the first step. This bony collar formation around the diaphysis for you know support. First step.
that around or around formation? Around, sorry. Okay. Now, um, well, what's going to happen is the chondrocytes in the center, they're going to die. The hypertrophy, and then the matrix will calcify, and then the enlarged chondrocytes die. And when there's no cells to maintain the tissue, the tissue goes away. So it creates a cavity on the inside. That's very important. Chondrocytes. They die, cavitates, inside diaphysis. So you have this empty cavity there. It doesn't show the bony collar in this picture that I used, but that's why you wanted the bony collar, so because it's all cavitated out in the middle, it would kind of collapse. So that's what I say here. In the cavitation, the chondrocytes die, basically causing the cavitation. So you have this empty space there. And the next thing that happens is a blood vessel needs to invade that cavity. And it needs to bring all the different cell types that can rebuild the spongy bone in that cavity. So I'll call it cavity invasion. The book calls it um, this invasion by a, a periosteal bud. It's just something that invaginates in, and it brings a blood vessel with it. That's what the picture shows. Blood vessel of periosteal bu uh, bud. The blood vessel will bring all the cells to rebuild the cavity with spongy bone. Okay. Blood vessels bring cells. So th those would be, you know, the osteogenic cells like the osteoblasts, right? Bring cells to build spongy bone in cavity. Remember, this cavity is in the diaphysis. showing you there. I haven't talked about the knobby ends of the bone, the epiphysis yet. It's like the primary ossification center. That's what we call it when you fill the cavity with spongy bone. Okay, you might want to note that. You get the spongy bone in there, call it the primary ossification center. So I'll put it kind of number one with a little circle next to it, that usually means primary. So if you're with me here, that's primary. What, what does this mean? Secondary. Secondary, okay. Yeah, you're, you're on to it. So that's pretty obvious. Did you say that? Primary. Primary ossification center. Because there is going to be a secondary one in the epiphyses, but we just haven't gotten there quite yet. So in the next step, a bit of remodeling happens. It's like you built all this spongy bone, but then you're going to break it back down. Okay, and you're going to use all that excess calcium to strengthen the diaphysis and put that spongy bone around the shaft. Okay, so they call that the remodeling of the diaphysis. So where we, where we were, you had spongy bone in there, and you remodel it by first breaking it down. So when you get rid of the spongy bone you put there, that creates a cavity called the medullary cavity.
also take that calcium and then you deposit it around the shaft of the diaphysis to strengthen it. Deposit calcium around diaphysis to strengthen it. Because you've hollowed it out in the middle. So essentially the cavity, if you had a cavity, you put bone in it, you disintegrated the bone and made another cavity. Now that medullary cavity will contain marrow. Okay, it could be red or yellow. Yellow marrow has no blood function, but the red marrow makes the blood. So, um, but that, that's where the bone marrow would be in that medullary cavity of long bone. So, okay. so our, you know, our long bones are basically hollowed out in the middle. Okay? Maybe you didn't know that, but they are. And the other thing that's happening is, along with during, during the same time, in remodeling the diaphysis, you're invading the epiphysis. Okay. The epiphyseal invasion is the same as when it happened in the diaphysis. So this invasion, you're going, to, you're going to get secondary ossification centers in the epiphysis. Get secondary ossification centers. Okay, it's understood it's in the epiphysis because it's the epiphyseal invasion. Now I have different kinds of cartilage there, articular versus epiphyseal. Uh, I'll note that on the next slide. And so we've got ossification centers now in the knob ends of the bone, the epiphysis. There is a difference there. In the secondary ossification, when you build the spongy bone, you don't disintegrate it like you did in the diaphysis. You just leave it there. I'm just writing spongy bone remains. It is not broken down. It just stays there. And the epiphyses are surrounded by two types of cartilage. of cartilage are hyaline. So it's like here's one knob end. Let's just say now let's say the secondary ossification is what kind of bone? Spongy or compact? Spongy. Okay, so that's spongy bone. But it's surrounded by all this I'm going to draw a line so it's like all my cross hatches, that's spongy. Okay? But from there to there, that's compact. So that's compact bone. So that's spongy. This is one epiphysis. It's covered with cartilage. On the top. And that's called an articular cartilage, because that'll help articulate to the other bone in the joint. 
so you don't get bone on bone contact. So that's why it's called articular. Bones articulate, that's how they connect at joints. Articular cartilage. It's hyaline cartilage. The other cartilage, which separates epiphysis from diaphysis, is right here. More cartilage right there. That thin row of cartilage, it's, it's like your growth plate. So we call it the epiphyseal plate cartilage. term, but it makes sense. It's how your bones get longer, and that's what happens when you grow, right? Because, what kind of tissue is it? Cartilage. And when you replace cartilage with bone, it's like this cartilage, as long as it's there, and you replace it with cartilage, it'll kind of like extend that way. I'm exaggerating, but your bones won't get that long. But as long as cartilage is there, being replaced with bone, the bones get longer and you get taller. As soon as the cartilage goes away and it completely ossifies, you stop growing, which usually happens around puberty. So that's your growth plane. So that's why you, know, you break your hip when you're like you're nine and you like damage that growth plate and it's replaced with scar tissue, you might stunt your growth. This growth plate is so important. Essentially, when the cartilage is there, how many bones do you see here? Technically, you could say three, because that's a bone separated by cartilage. That's a bone. That's a third bone. And technically, you want to be really anatomy nerd technical. That's three bones. OK, now that's pretty much it. I mean, from childhood to adolescence, this is what you got. OK, that's, that's a pretty mature bone. A um, few more slides here. Don't yell. No, no, no. You guys signed up for a flipping five unit class and we only meet twice a week, so I got you. I got you. <laughs> You're not going anywhere. I'm going to keep going. One time I taught this four unit class that only met once a week. And that class killed me. Three hours of lecture followed by three hours of lab. I almost died. There was one day I literally went to the car and had chest pains. I had to stop in that class. But it's not so bad, at least we get two days. Okay. So, the different kinds of bone here, they're the same in terms of composition. The organic, inorganic matrix is the same. The only difference is the osteon, versus the trabecular bone, which I mentioned before. But the composition is the same. It's not like made out of something else. They're both made out of the, the same stuff. They only differ in the amount of solid matter. We, we want our bones to be ho either hollowed out with a medullary cavity or to be spongy on the inside so our bones don't weigh us down. Mechanically, they still work for us. Okay? But we want our compact bone to be very sturdy with the osteon arrangement. So um, I think it helps to kind of look at other pictures of bone models to help us understand the structure of adult bone. So here's a picture of a couple models I pulled out. They're over there. This will help us get through um, the bone lab. And um, while I'm thinking about it, we have two labs now. You have your microscope lab. I think some of you have done it. A little side note. And then there's that, that piece of paper that I put out there today. That's the bone lab. I'm going to make these both do end of class Monday. Okay, so when we get to lab, after we take the lab quiz, just know that you don't have to turn everything in today. I'm going to give you time to think about this stuff. And uh, yeah. And while I'm talking about things that are due, there's a couple other things I want to mention that I don't want you to forget about. 
you guys know when homework two is due? Sunday? Yes. And what about lecture exam two? Sunday. Friday, Sunday. It's due Sunday, but you could do it earlier. So I, I want to be sure while I'm thinking about it, since I'm not going to see you after today for the rest of this week, that, uh, that that's ingrained in your head. Now, so back to the slideshow here. What we got here is, looks like a wedding cake. What they did was, they took the layers of the osteon and just telescoped it out so you could see that the concentric lamella of an osteon have a crisscross design. Okay. So this kind of gets to osteon structure. Concentric lamellae. Concentric means you know layer outside of a layer outside of a layer, just like they're being pulled up there. Concentric lamellae have the collagen and those those inorganic crystals. design. I mean, we saw the same theme in the intervertebral disc and the annulus fibrosis. Well, what they're showing you there is like, say you have collagen, I don't know, collagen fiber, collagen fiber, coll they're, they're all kind of going this way. And then the crystals, the calcium phosphate crystals, they're, they're going that way too, in line with the collagen. In one layer, in a, in, a, in a layer next to it, they're, they're kind of going the other way, like more, more like this, twisting the other way. This twists this way, this twists the opposite way. And the crystals are aligned with that. So you could twist the bone, apply a twisting force in one way or the other way. And you should be able to resist the twisting force. Of course, you can still have spiral fractures in bone. But basically, what we say is, because of this design, um, bones can resist torsion forces, which is a twisting force. So that's what I want to show you there. It's modeled quite nicely. Um, some other pictures I got. That's the osteon. Here's the trabecula. Remember I said it's a spongy bone sandwich? So that top picture really shows it. Remember, this is our intramembrous ossification. And um, here's a nice cross-sectional view of a skull bone. And here's a nice magnified view of the trabecular struts. So this is still lamellar bone. It's just not a big old osteon. Okay. Um, it's just there's many layers within that small little strut. So this is filled with what kind of marrow? Red marrow. So what I do is, um, in a craniotomy, I take the scalp off, I go like this, cut here, and I pull it back like that. And then I, there's muscles here, I gotta get those down. And then you know, take a bone saw, you just cut all the way around, and then you take the skull cap off, and I hold it up to the light. And it looks, there's like there's black splotches, splotches in it, which I can show you. That would be the red marrow that's in your um, cranial bones. So there's red marrow in there. I have seen it. It's not pictured there. Here's a picture of the tiny little struts, and they're covered with an endosteum. So that all those little tiny little struts have cells in them, and the, all those cells need, need blood supply. So it's like, thing to note there, note that trabecular bone
is covered with an endosteum. It's also lamellar bone, and don't, don't forget that. It has a lamellar arrangement. I'm kind of being a dead horse here. It's lamellar bone. I thought that was a good picture showing you that the little struts have a lamellar arrangement and they're covered with an endosteum. Whereas compact bone is covered with what we call the periosteum. Remember, trabecular bone is inner, compact bone is more outer. Here's a picture of that. Um, that's the femoral, proximal end of a femoral bone, your hip bone. Uh, well, basically, your um, thigh bone is more accurate to say. And your thigh bone can be hollowed out in the middle because when you exert stress on it, illustrated by this dotted line which represents the arc of stress, it falls at a point right in the middle where there's compressive forces in it. It's like you're stressing it this way. And there's tension out there, but no stress in the middle, so you don't need bone there. You need compact bone here, but it can be hollowed out there. And actually, the proximal uh, femur is where you have red marrow. And there's no bone there. That's one place where you can tap red marrow. Okay, so that's why you can have hollowed out bones. <clears throat> Getting to uh, the structure of a long bone, showing the full femur bone in length, I wanted to show you that. Notice how it's cut longitudinally, and we have that in the lab. It's like there's a couple of boxes right over there. You can see the section femur in lab. Oops, since we got a couple. And what you can do is try to see the spongy bone and compact bone yourself. And well, the structure, I already mentioned epiphysis diaphysis. When it's all fused together, they fuse at the metaphysis. So think of the metaphysis as a joint between the knobby ends of a bone. Write that down. So you got epiphysis. Epip I, should say, I should say epiphyses, because there's two of them. So ES is plural, IS is singular. I could give a whole lecture on singular and plural in anatomy. It, does, it is confusing, uh, so many different terms. So, um, epiphyses, I, I just call them the knob ends. And in the knob ends, what kind of bone is like in the center of the knob? Spongy or compact? Spongy, but it is surrounded by compact. Okay, so the knob ends you got spongy surrounded by the diaphysis meets the epiphysis at the metaphysis. <laughs> so metaphysis is basically a fused joint. Okay. It's all ossified, right? And um, there's no growth plate there in an adult. It's all ossified. And uh, that's all I'll say about that. So go up here. The diaphysis. It's the shaft of the bone. And its structure is basically a medullary cavity surrounded by compact bone. That's what you're supposed to get out of that picture. And um, I have a picture of the, the skull bone, which we already looked at. It's spongy bone. It's a spongy bone sandwich, as I said before. And so if you look at the compact bone close up, 
we looked at the osteon before. Um, let's see if I can turn the lights off here. The osteon, the ones that aren't pulled up like wedding cakes, they show you other things. You can still see an osteon right there. Okay. That that isn't kind of telescoped out for you. They have other ones too. Notice you have osteons kind of in the middle, but on either edge, there's lamellar bone here, surrounding these osteons, and osteons, osteons, and osteons, and then there's an edge here of more lamellar bone. This is called circumferential lamella, you should know that. This is the structure of compact bone. So, continued. Circumferential, because it's the circumference of the compact bone on both sides, okay? on both sides of the osteons, on the inside and the outsides. Students forget about the inside so circumferential lamella because circumference usually means just the outer circle, but it's both inner and outer in terms of naming it in our models. Other terms for our bone models that help you understand the model of compact bone, there's a blank one. <clears throat> well, this is good practice for like a future lab quiz. If I just said identify that middle bracket there, what, what would you say? What? Identify. Osteon. Or if I said identify that or identify that, I just, just put osteon. Now what if I put it here, this bracket? Circumferential, circumferential lamella. Okay, so that's what that model shows. I think quite nicely actually. It shows other things here. Um, let me move on. If you look up close to the close picture, now those osteons, because they're circular, they can't pack completely tightly. So you have gaps in between them. So you have interstitial lamella between the gaps to, to fill the gaps. They're, they're, they're gap fillers, essentially. So let me write that term on the board. interstitial lamella. So basically you got lamellar bones in between osteons. Osteons is the main structure, but there's gaps between the round columns. We also have um, what's called the central or haversian canal. Um, that's where the blood vessel is. Write that down. Central canal, or also called haversian canal. It's got, it's got other things, but we'll just say blood vessels for now. They do show you the osteocytes with the canaliculi stuck between the layers of lamellar bone. Okay. I would note that too as something to identify. So notice how they kind of draw them in there, the dark spots. But notice here they're not drawn in. It's just the empty space, which we call lacuna. It got cut off there, lacuna. The, the osteocytes are in lacuna, AE plural, 
osteocytes in the puna. And you uh, have an unlabeled version of that slide here so you can practice. Here's a side view of that model. And I already mentioned the central canal, which run perpendicular with the osteon. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not perpendicular. They run with the osteon. Yeah. So these blood vessels um, run parallel. I wanted to say that the, one, the blood vessels that traverse and run perpendicular to it are called the perforating canal or the Volkmann's canal. They're going perpendicular to it. They connect with the central canal there. So note the per perforating. Or Volkmann's. I'm just going to say they run perpendicular to the osteons. The other model we have is this one. It's over there. This bone structure. Let's kind of look at what it shows real quick. things, nerve, artery, vein, lymphatics, all in the middle, central canal, right? And then we have our lamella coming out from that. So I took close-up pictures. Um, number five on the key, it says haversion lamella. They call it, they use a slightly different term because it's the haversion canal in the middle. So these are layers of bone, haversion lamella. Um, number seven, are the osteo it's hard to see the seven is in the blue there but the blue structures are the osteocytes and nine all the red lines filled with blood are the canaliculi okay filled with blood and they contain the cytoplasmic extensions of the osteocytes right i said that they lie in there um okay osteocytes are linked by gap junction so here's a close-up picture. Again, you got five, or did that. Six is the gap filler, okay? 10 is the empty space. What lives in that space? Osteocytes. You just call the space lacuna, okay? On the side of that model, no, it's the same picture. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, I just labeled it there. Nerve, artery, vein, lymph vessel. Labeled it there for you. Here, here's the one. On the side of it, they show you what looks like, just from a side view, the blue is the osteocyte. The red around it is the lacuna with the canaliculi, and they're all linked together. Okay. I think this is a good place to stop. <laughs> oh, we're going to take a quiz.